Welcome everyone to the second part of um, the lecture series on Theodorson's unsteady aerodynamic model. So to recap, uh, Theodorson's unsteady aerodynamic model is an upgrade from quasi-steady thin air flow theory where you can take into account the wake that is shed by the wing as well as the added mass force that is engendered when you have unsteady motions. <clears throat> in the last lecture, we talked about the preliminaries of the theory, including uh, conformal mapping, things like relating the velocity component in the plate and this circle plane. And in this lecture, we will move on to derive the non-circulatory force contribution um, from Theodorson. So to start off... <clears throat> For the non-circulatory part, the way we derive that contribution is through the combination of source and sink sheets that enforce no flow through or no penetration boundary condition. In addition, we sort of work in the circle plane and then we transform to the plate plane. So essentially this schematic shows what it's like to sort of transform the uh, the circle plane to the plate plane and I talked uh, about this in depth in the last lecture but essentially what happens here is that through the transfer through the conformal mapping transformation between the plate and the circle plane you map the circle here to the upper and lower surface of the flat plate and anything that is outside of the circle is mapped to the outside of the plate. In addition, anything inside the circle is also mapped to points outside of the plate. And you can see this when you plug in numbers for, um, when you plug in the numbers into the uh, uh, circle to plate transformation which is also in the notes of the last lecture. So one thing you might think is that, okay, you have a source sheet here and you have a sink sheet here, okay? And then you transform this circle to the plate plane. That means that you're essentially squishifying or squishing the circle into a plane and thus you're gonna end up with sources and sinks lying uh, on top of each other, thus canceling each other out. However, this is not the case because let's think of a path going from a source to a sink. So this is a path going from a source to a sink in the, in the circle plane. And what is the equivalent path in the plate plane? Now, as we said, the interior of the circle is not transformed to the plate, but it's also transformed to points outside of the plate, which means that this path, if you take this path and you transform it to the plate plane, it's essentially, again, going from the outside upper surface to the lower surface. It does not go directly in the flat plane. And um, in more mathematical um, language, the transformation between the circle plane to the flat plane essentially creates two separate sheets, two separate Riemann surfaces. Whereas if you want to go from the plate plane, from the upper surface and the lower surface, you can never really cross the plate. You actually have to go all the way around it. And But that is more evident when you think about, okay, if you take this path and you transform it, what does that path look like? Moving on, as I said, mapping maps outside of circle to entire plate plane and the interior is also mapped to the entire plate plane. Um, another point is the difference between values of the velocity potential at co corresponding pairs of points in the two planes are equal. So what does that mean? That means that if you get two points in the circle plane, let's say two points here, and you transform them to the plate plane, 
Wherever these points will reside in the plate plane, they could be also next to each other. They could be far apart, wherever they are. If you take these points here, let me write that. So let's say we take one point, another point. This point is transferred here. This point is transformed here. The, the, um, the, the difference in the velocity potentials in terms of... Um, C and eta is also the same is equal to the uh, difference in the velocity potential in the Z plane, which is X and Y. Okay, so let's expand on this notion. Let's zoom into this is a part of the circle. And this is the same part transformed in the plate plane. So you transform the surface of the circle to the plate. Let's take some two points on the plate. Call this x1 and x2. Sorry. Um, I meant call this x1 and y1. And we'll call this point x2 and y2. And... This here is sort of the uh, unit vector in the, well, not the unit ve vector, it's the differential vector in the x direction. So um, I'll put this axis here, x and y, and then we'll put some axis here, um, r and theta in the circle plane. So these points, let's say when you transform, transform them to the circle plane, they would, obviously they would still lie on the circle because on the circle circumference because the plate is, when you transform the plate, it is uh, transformed to the circle. So again, let's say these are the corresponding point, C1, um, eta1, and C2, Eta 2, okay. And let's say we are integrating along this path, which is equivalent to integrating along this path as well. Due to the nature of the transformation. So, and also let me change this. I did not mean vector. This is um, this is a differential element dx, and this is the equivalent differential element ds, and ds is the differential element along the uh, the circle. So, all right. So as we said, the difference between values of the potential function, velocity potential function, corresponding to pairs of points in the two planes are equal, and we explained that earlier. So in equation form, the difference between the velocity potential at the two points in the plate plane is equal to that difference of the points transferred to the um, circle plane. Oh, sorry, this is supposed to be um, y1, okay, and c1, and um, eta1. Great. And what does that mean? I mean, essentially, the difference between the velocity potential here and here, the velocity potential... At this point, and this point is simply the integral of the differential velocity potential along this sort of path. So we can rewrite this equation as integral from 1 to 2 of d phi 
prime. And again, the prime signifies the, that this is the perturbation velocity potential related to the unsteady phenomena of x and y, right? Which is basically the um, derivative of, it's the derivative of d phi prime along this path which is equal to the difference in the velocity potential here and here. So moving on, and again, this is equal to its counterpart in the um, circle world, C and eta. So this is, this is the integral in the plate plane, this is the integral in the circle plane, and then we can rewrite the integral in the circle plane with a new coordinate system as such, instead of coordinates eta and z and uh, x and eta, we can just put r and theta. And this is just a, we're just redefining the coordinates we wanna use rather than using um, x and eta, we decide to use theta and r, we're free to do so. All right, so moving on. Let me just, uh, okay. So, yeah. So we know that the derivative of the velocity potential with respect to x is equal to u prime. And this is the horizontal perturbation velocity in the plate plane. And thus we can rewrite d phi prime of x and y to be equal to u prime dx. And then we can do the same sort of velocity potential derivative in the circle plane. So d phi over ds, and again, ds is just the, ds is the differential element along the circle. That is equal to q theta. q theta is the velocity in the plate, in the circle plane that is tangent to the circle. So you can just rewrite um, d phi as being equal to q theta, sorry, q theta ds. And then we know that ds is simply the differential element along the circle, which can be redefined in theta as b over 2 d theta. So um, we know that if you have some sort of section of a circle, and this is theta, and this is r, we know that s is equal to r theta. So this is just a, um, a version of that. All right, great. So we can rewrite d phi prime as um, half b q theta d theta. Great, so let's sort of put, put these two terms into this equation, and then we get, and I'll change the color, phi two prime minus phi one prime, either along the circle or in the plate plane, where two and one are points that are that are corresponding, well, let me rephrase that, where two and one are basically either points in the plate plane or their corresponding pair in the circle plane. So to be more clear, phi two of x and y minus phi two of x one, sorry. Um, okay. x two and y two minus phi two prime minus phi one prime. And this is at x one and y one. That is equal to the same thing for its corresponding pair in the circle plane, which is the following.
um, either two, either two minus prime of either one and they c one and eta one, and that is equal to either this integral theta one and theta two q theta b over two d theta, which is equal to minus from x one to x two u prime of dx. All right. So as we said, the we're just we basically just put these two expressions into here and then we added this minus sign because if you see here if you're integrating along this path this path theta is in the positive direction of q theta however this is exactly analogous to integrating along this path where u prime is in the opposite direction of x so this is where this minus sign comes from. But other than that, this, these two terms come from, again, putting these into our equation of the integral of the uh, differential velocity potential element. Great, so let me write that down. This minus sign is because we have integration is positive in theta direction, but negative in x direction. All right, so we now need to determine the distributions of the sources along the upper surface of the cylinder that will satisfy the no flow through boundary conditions. So here we're going to populate the upper surface with a bunch of sources. We call that a source sheet. And we wanna pick the, the strength of the source sheet or the source sheet distribution strength such, a, such that the no penetration boundary condition is enforced. So to start off, we got the velocity potential at x and y due to source at x prime and y prime. So we're going, we want to find the velocity potential at some point x, y due to some source that is located at x prime and y prime. So for that, the velocity potential of a source is equal to h over 4 pi natural log of x minus x prime squared plus y minus y prime again squared. And then this population is equivalent to this population. So we, to, to get the, uh, the um the velocity potential at some point x y but this time in due to the entire source sheet we simply take this term and we integrate it along minus b to b so that would be equivalent to saying phi prime at x y and t so at some point x y at time t is equal to one over four pi and then we integrate from minus b to b because we're integrating along the entire plate because we want to find the velocity potential at some point x, y due to this entire source sheet. H plus, and this plus here indicates we, we are working on the upper surface because the sources are placed on the upper surface. That's what the positive simply means, x prime, where the uh, source is, where a source element is, t, natural log of x minus x prime squared. And then we're going to set y prime to zero because we know that the sources are all on the x plane. 
sorry, uh, are all on the x-axis because we're employing small angle assumptions here. So we can simply say that y prime goes to zero. So simply becomes um, y squared. And then this entire thing times dx prime. So we're integrating with respect to x prime because we're varying the sources. Or we're sort of integrating along the plate, employing different sources, and each source is at some x prime. And I'm going to skip some math here, but this math can be found in equations 5, 2, 46 to 5, 2, 48 and air elasticity by Bisplinghoff. And remember that the whole point of going through this exercise is that we wanna satisfy the no penetration boundary condition, which means that the fluid parcel should have the, um, should not penetrate the normal, uh, should not penetrate the, uh, the wing. So based on that, we wanna find the upwash or the vertical velocity of the fluid at the surface of the plate. So at it's a so the upwash is a function of x which varies between minus b and b and then at y equal to zero because again remember that the uh, the wing is prescribed to the x-axis so the wing is on the x-axis due to small angle assumptions and small amplitude assumptions and we're gonna place this plus here to indicate that we're actually talking about the upper surface. And obviously the, uh, the fluid upwash is a function of time. Now this is a, now the upwash or the vertical velocity is simply the derivative of d phi prime in, uh, with dy or partial of y. And again, it's a function of the same things that we said earlier. And this math simplifies this term, takes the derivative, and the answer comes out to be half h plus of x and t. And what does that mean? That means that the vertical upwash, the vertical upwash at some position x is half the source strength at this position. So what this means is, um, let's say we want to find the vertical velocity here. That vertical velocity is equal to half the source strength at that same position. And those two things can vary with time and vary along the wing. And if you want to see how this term comes out uh, mathematically from taking the partial derivative of this really nasty term, look at these equations. Moving on, we can uh, box this really nice um, result in. And remember, we said that W is equal to W with a subscript A. And this is just another way of naming it. W A of X and T. And again, this vertical velocity is the vertical velocity of the wing. So it's the vertical velocity of each point on the wing. And it's a function of x and t. So we're going to box that in like so. Similarly, or likewise, the strength of the sink at any position along the wing as a function of time is negative that of the source. So let me put that in here. So what I'm saying here, since the, the sink acts exactly opposite to the source, where the source pretty much gives out velocity, and the sink takes in velocity or takes in fluid, the, um, the strength of, the, of each sink along the strength of each sink along the wing on the bottom surface, and that's why we use the minus sign here, along the bottom surface is equal to negative, is equal to the negative of 
twice the vertical velocity at that point. Now, the reason that we didn't really have to take into account the uh, sink, the sinks when we were looking for the uh, the strength of the source is because of the fact that the sinks and the sources in this um, combination do not affect the vertical velocities at each other. Meaning that if, so again, this is this uh, note here reiterates what I was saying. Sinks have no influence on the vertical velocity at source and vice versa, which means that on the plate, you have a source. The vertical velocity experienced by the source is not affected by any of the sinks. And the vertical velocity experienced by the sink is not affected by any of the uh, sources. The reason for that is this. Let's say, again, remember that we have in the circle plane a cylinder and we populate the cylinder with a bunch of sources and a bunch of sinks. Recall that we need to satisfy the no penetration boundary condition on the cylinder, which makes the cylinder a, a streamline. Now, the fact that this cylinder is a streamline, that means that when transformed to the flat plate, the flat plate itself is a streamline. And because of the fact that all the sources and the sinks lie on this flat plate, that means that the uh, all the velocity, so at the location of the sources and the sinks, which is the flat plate, these this is the zone where the sources and the sinks live, the velocity vector is always pointing along the streamline, and the streamline is directly perpendicular to the vertical velocity, which means that the vertical velocity vector that is, sorry, which means that the velocity vector produced by the sources and sinks does not have any component in the vertical direction. Because again, the vertical and the horizontal directions are orthogonal bases or they're perpendicular and thus they do not influence each other. What does that mean? That means that whatever velocity is created at the streamline, at the point where the sources and the sinks are, there is absolutely no component to that velocity created by sources or sinks in the vertical direction. Thus, they don't really interact with one another. Anyway, this was like a side point, but moving on. Um, recall from last lecture, we found the relation between the velocities in the circle plane and the plate plane. And we found that QR, or the velocity in the radial direction, is equal to 2W sine theta, where theta is simply the angle any point on the cylinder makes with the, um, with the horizontal axis. So, again... Um, we can plug in the uh, this expression into what we found here, and we find that h plus at r equal to b over two, so on the cylinder, at any theta at any time. So theta, when you vary theta, you vary the point you pick on the circle. That is equal to two q r, which is similar to two w. So by analogy to the uh, this these equations that we found in the circle plane, um, which is equal to is equal to two w a sine theta. Likewise, the strength of the sink at these at the corresponding uh, location on the sink sheet is equal to minus two q r, which is equal to minus 2 wa 
sine theta. So now it's time to find the velocity potential field due to the source sheet and the sink sheet. And for that, let's consider corresponding differential elements of source and sink sheets, i.e. let's consider a differential element from the source sheet and a differential element from the sink sheet. Let's type this down. So we have our source, our sink, and then what is the length of that differential sort of element? And what's that the position of the differential element? So to start off, let's draw some lines here. We have some position from the positive x-axis and we will call this psi we will call this minus psi all right so the position of the source is psi the position of the sink is minus psi now we also know that the um, differential length of the source and the sink would be half b because that's the radius multiplied by the angle that that differential element spans which is the psi and likewise for the sink and let's pick some point let's pick some point p and the goal is to find the um, velocity potential at point P due to the source and the sink. All right, so we're gonna draw another straight line to point P. And we're gonna say that this point P lies at some angle theta. And let me take this out of the way to make things a little bit clearer. Great, so one thing we know is that the velocities induced by the source and the sink would be on the same line as the line connecting the source or the sink to that point. For instance, the velocity that's induced by the sink on P is in the same um, is on the same line as the line connecting P to the so, uh, to the sink. Likewise for the source. So we know that the velocity at, uh, induced at P by some differential element um, of the source is essentially dQ plus and plus is, uh, signifies that we're talking about a source. Likewise, it's on the same line for the line connecting the sink and point P, and we'll call that dQ minus. And the, the, the direction where the arrow points is arbitrary at this point, and if the arrow actually points in the other direction, we would just get a negative sign. So, um, yeah, anyway, moving on, we have all these sort of Um, geometries um, allocated and now we will call this line s1 and we will call this line s2 all right so we can now see two triangles that have sort of emerged and we have this triangle over here and I'm just gonna color it like that and then we have this triangle over here So let's first deal with the purple triangle to find. So our aim now is to find what is the length of S1 and what is the length of S2. So moving on to that, let's talk about the purple triangle. So the purple triangle, as you can see, these sides are equal because these are both radiuses. So we essentially have an isosceles triangle. So. Let's draw an isosceles triangle right here. And 
let's sort of split it into two and we have a right angle here and since this angle is psi and this is theta that means that this angle is psi minus theta so this angle here is psi minus theta and then this side here is s1 which we're trying to find fantastic so the way to find that we can actually if, if we want to use some trick we can divide we've divided these um this triangle into two triangles and we know that the sine of this angle is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side sorry the hypotenuse and then the sine of this angle is also equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse so sine of have the angle now because we're only looking at one of the two triangles sine minus theta over 2 is equal to the opposite side which is s1 over 2 over the hypotenuse and as you see the hypotenuse is the radius which is b over 2 which is equal to s1 over b fantastic and we can actually do the uh all right, so we can move things around and we know that S1 is equal to B sine of phi minus theta over two. And likewise, we have the, the blue triangle here, right? This is the blue triangle. And this side is equal to this side and now instead of having an angle equal to psi minus theta, this is psi plus theta because you have psi here and theta. So you add both to get the sign of the, the size of the total angle. So it, the expression for S2 will be very similar. It will be B sine, but instead of having psi minus theta, you end up with psi plus theta. So now we know the length of the... Uh, Lengths, we know the length of the lines connecting the arbitrary source to P, arbitrary sink to P. So for a source element, we know what the, uh, the velocity potential is based on, uh, we know the velocity potential at a point due to a source and it is phi is equal to h over 2 pi natural log of r, where r is the distance between the point at which we're trying to find the velocity potential and the actual source. And thus, ur is equal to h over 2 pi r, simply the derivative. Fantastic. So um, we can now find the magnitude velocity of the source at p, well, the differential uh, velocity magnitude due to the differential element of the source S1 on P. And that is equal to H plus multiplied by the length of the differential element, which is half B D psi. So the numerator here is the strength of the differential element over 2 pi r, and in this case, r is really s1, because that's the distance between the source and p, and this gives us the magnitude of dq plus. So we'll keep going. s1, which is equal to h plus times half b d psi over 2 pi, and um, we've determine that S1 is equal to this term. So it's um, B sine psi minus theta over two. And we can sub in H plus equal to four W A sine psi. And I just realized that I made a mistake in one of my formulations. Um, all right, so yeah, here's the mistake. Let me correct that. 
um, it should be four and not two. So again, two QR, right? You sub two W sine theta for QR. So you end up with four W A sine theta. All right, that concludes this bit. Moving on. <clears throat> so we sub in this term into H plus and we get the following dq plus is equal to wa sine psi d psi over pi sine half psi minus theta. And likewise, we can find the magnitude of the velocity induced at p due to the sink. And that is wa sine psi d psi over pi sine half psi plus theta. All right now we would like to find dq theta. So we found the magnitude of dq plus and dq minus, and I forgot to put the theta in here. Now we want to find the actual vector. So, um, all right, so here I've picked that same sort of point P. I'll write it here and I impose this sort of axes of R and theta. So let's draw the velocity vectors of dq minus and dq plus. And this time we're gonna take care of the direction. This is dq minus. And this is dq plus, which is a rehash of of what we essentially of what we did here, except we changed the direction of this one. The angle between dq minus and theta is psi plus theta over two, and this angle is psi minus theta over two. And you could probably prove these angles to yourself given that the theta axis is tangent to the circle at point P. So given this geometry right here and the fact that this axis is tangent to the circle. So moving on now we can actually find the, um, the vector, the dq theta vector. And I wanna preface that um, I did have a mistake here. This is not dq theta, this is dq, and this should be also dq minus, so there is no subscript theta here, because these are the total vectors, this and this, so not the vector in the theta direction. We're now gonna find the vectors in the theta direction. So um, let's write this down. So dq theta, again, the... Uh, component of the vector in this direction or on this axis is minus dq plus and again this is we put a minus here because remember that the positive dq plus direction points in the opposite direction to the theta axis um so yeah now we know that so moving on it's cosine of half psi minus theta and then again you can see that the direction of dq minus is also opposite to the direction of theta so we put another minus in there dq minus cosine of half psi plus theta and now subbing in for the expressions of dq plus and dq minus, which we found here. And some math or trig that we will skip, dq theta ends up being equal to 2wa sine squared of psi d psi over 
pi of cosine psi minus cosine theta. So now we can integrate dq theta to get the aggregate effect of all possible pairs by um, theta and varying psi between 0 and pi. That results in the following term, 2 over pi, the integral from 0 to pi of wa sine squared psi d psi over cosine psi minus cosine theta. And this is equivalent to equation 5257 from Bisplengoff. And now I want you to recall the earlier expression that we came up with with the relation between the uh, different velocity potentials phi 2 prime minus phi 1 prime is equal to the integral from theta 1 to theta 2 where theta 1 and theta 2 are just two different angles of q theta b over 2 d theta and that is equal to its equivalent in the plate plane the integral from x1 to x2 of u prime dx now if we want to integrate from some angle theta to pi that is equivalent to integrating from some angle theta to the point pi so this is phi prime of pi and t minus phi on the upper surface because we're looking at angles from 0 to pi, which signify the upper circle of theta and t. And let me just make this a little neater. Theta and t. Well, that is equal to the integral from theta to pi of q theta b over 2 d theta. So nothing new here. Well, what we can do here is that we can set this term to 0. And why do we set this to 0? It's because phi of pi and t is only a function of time at this point because we've set theta to pi. And thus, it is a constant with respect to theta. So since we're integrating over theta, this term is constant with respect to this integral, and thus we can, it, it essentially acts as a constant offset with respect to time. So for example, for some period of time, let's say t equal to 2, phi prime of pi over t will equal to some constant minus the value of the function with risk as a function of different angles. So basically we can set this to zero because it is not a function of theta. So this is something that we it, that is permissible to do. All right, so we um, sub q theta that we found here into our term in here, which results in the following equation. pi and then 0 to pi of wa sine square psi over cosine psi minus cosine theta d psi d theta and this is equation 
5259 from Bisplingoff. All right, moving on. Now, as you can see, if we draw the circle plane again, we have a source sheet, a sink sheet, and if you look at the Q theta, it is always pointing in the direction of the theta axis. Because, and Q theta is always pointing in the direction of the theta axis because of the exact anti-symmetry of the source sheet and the sink sheet. Now, moreover, we know that the source and sink sheet have the same distribution of strength along their sheet, but they're in the opposite, they all have opposite signs, plus and minus. So what this entails is due to the exact anti symmetry between the source sheet and the sink sheet q theta is symmetrical which means that q of theta at some theta is equal to q of theta at the negative of theta, that angle for example the q theta over here is equal to the q theta over there because they're both like at a theta angle uh, from the x-axis in the positive and in the negative direction so because again of the anti-symmetry between the source and the sink sheet in terms of their strength they will create the same magnitudes of q theta and because of the fact that q theta intuitively will always point in the same direction because for example if you have a source coming out of here it's letting velocity out this way if you have a sink over here it's taking in velocity this way you can see q theta is running along the circle and thus at every point at every exactly anti-symmetrical point so at any point theta q theta will equal to the same, will be equal to the Q theta or the velocity in the theta direction at the point that is anti-symmetrical or that is at minus theta degrees from it, which is given by this law over here. And since the Q theta in the negative and positive theta directions are the same, we can say that Okay, the Q theta over here is equal to here. The Q theta over here is equal to there, which says that the Q theta variation along this line will be equal to, will be exactly equal to the Q variation of the same line, but in the opposite direction. And that Q theta variation is um, related to the velocity potential. So this is shown in this diagram, which... Again, since the Q theta over here is equal to the Q theta over here, because they are at equal magnitude angles, but in the opposite directions. And since each subsequent Q theta will be equal to each subsequent Q theta from the other side, that entails that the differential in the velocity potential between two points that are anti-symmetrical or sorry, that are symmetrical from each other about the x-axis, the differential and the velocity potential will be equal. So this velocity potential is equal to that. So we can write out, we can write this out. And I, it's kind of a subtle point, but again, phi pi over t, right, which is the, this velocity potential minus the velocity potential on the upper surface of some theta and t is equal to, again, so we are trying to find the expression for the differential velocity, differential potential. So the delta potential is this point minus that point, and this delta potential is this point minus this point. So we're going to write this out. Phi prime of L of minus theta and t minus phi
5 pi and t. All right, and as, as we said, we said you set these to zero because we can. That means that phi L prime of minus theta and t is equal to the negative of phi U prime of theta and t. And I hope that this point came across, but it, if it didn't, just please feel free to email me and ask me about it. And we use the stipulation here to calculate delta p, which gives you the calculate, calculating the delta p distribution along the wing will give you the lift and the different forces. So now we get to another top. Not it's not another topic, but we need this to solve the equation for lift, and that is the unsteady Bernoulli equation, and that's the, the equation with which we will be able to um, find the delta pressure, which can give us the lift. So a form of the unsteady Bernoulli that's presented in Katz and Plotkin, a book I believe is called Low Speed Aerodynamics, is as follows, p infinity minus p over rho is equal to u squared over 2 minus u infinity squared over 2 plus d phi dt. And that's just a, a, um, a statement of the unsteady Bernoulli equation. This statement here signifies the, or captures the unsteadiness of the problem, so the variation of the velocity potential with respect to time. U infinity and P infinity, you can think of as the sort of far field fluid conditions. So the fluid in the far field has some pressure and is traveling at some free stream. And then, <clears throat> and then um, at some point of interest, it has the velocity U and P. And these are, this is the relation that governs or connects all these parameters together. Now, as I said before, we assume small disturbances. And what does that mean? That means that we can sort of split you into a main component, which is the free stream, plus some perturbation component, U prime. And again, the velocity potential can be split to a perturbation velocity potential plus the velocity potential of the free stream. And then we can sort of, we can sub those into this equation and we get the following. Of u infinity plus u prime and the whole thing is squared minus half of rho u infinity plus rho d phi prime dt. Now this term sort of disappeared because the partial derivative of the free stream velocity potential with respect to time is zero. Great, we can actually expand these components. So p infinity minus p is equal to half rho and then expand the stuff inside of the uh, uh, power. U infinity squared plus U prime squared plus two U infinity U prime. That is equal to minus, sorry, not equal to. This is, and then minus half rho U infinity squared plus rho D phi prime DT. All right, so you can see here that this term cancels with this term, and then we will linearize Bernoulli's equation, and thus any high order terms go away, so this goes to zero as well. And thus we are left with the following equation. Rho u infinity u prime plus rho d phi prime over dt. Well, 
this term here is actually can actually be rewritten as um, minus rho. Sorry, nope. Can be rewritten as rho of u infinity d phi over dx plus d phi prime over dt. And u prime is, you know, it's d phi dx. And then we can sort of take the negative of this equation, which would give you the following. So we are interested in finding the pressure difference between the upper and lower uh, surface of the wing. And when we find the delta P between the upper and lower surface, we can integrate that along the surface to get the lift force. So PU and that's pressure on the upper surface, minus PL is just equal to, again, we're going to use the term that we found here, PU minus P infinity minus PL minus P infinity. And again, we're going to uh, substitute this for the upper and lower terms which will equal to minus rho, open bracket, u infinity, d phi u prime over dx plus d phi u prime over dt minus u infinity, d phi prime l over dx plus d phi prime L over dt, close brackets, okay, microphone is on, great. Now, recall that phi prime of L of minus theta in t is equal to minus phi prime of u of theta in t because, and if you remember, this fact comes from the fact that we established that the velocity q theta is symmetrical about the x-axis. Great, so Subbing this into here, we get um, PU minus PL equal to minus 2 rho U infinity DU D phi prime DX plus D phi prime U of DT. All right, great. So as we said before, sources and sinks introduce no circulation. And thus, we are looking at only the non-circulatory component of the force here. So LNC is equal to, um, as I said, you can find the lift by integrating the pressure distribution or the delta pressure distribution along the wing, which would result in, result in the following term, dx equal to, to rho integral from minus b to b of u infinity d phi u prime over dx plus d phi u prime over dt dx 
And another way of writing this expression is this, and you can, so you can essentially use the chain rule, take the time derivative of this function using the chain rule, and you should back out this term here. So if you sort of consider a wing going from minus b to b, and then you want to express some term x, you can actually exp express x in terms of an angle using the following term, x is equal to minus b cosine theta. And you can check here, say, plug um, theta equal to zero. If you plug uh, theta equal to zero, cosine theta is equal to one, you back out minus b. And then if you plug in x equal to uh, theta equal to pi, you back out minus b times minus one, which will give you b. So essentially you can express x as some angle and we are going to use this expression here and make the transition to theta because that will help us later on in the derivation. So um, substituting x into this term here or substituting x equal to minus b cosine theta into this term will give you ln c equal to two rho b d dt or partial partial dt of the integral from zero to pi now because we established um, theta equal to zero is equivalent to x equal to minus b and theta equal to pi is equivalent to x equal to b so these are zero and pi are the new limits of the definite integral of d, d phi u prime d theta and we're going to box this in. All right, fantastic. Um, this is equivalent. This is this corresponds to um, equation five, two sixty four from Bisplinkov. Uh, now, note that ln c is equal to zero for steady flows. So. Assuming that you have a steady flow, that means the velocity potential does not change as a function of time. Thus, partial partial dt of this function goes to zero, and you end up with ln c equal to zero. Now, to actually get the non-circulatory lift, we sub w equal to a, which is the uh, vertical velocity of a vertical velocity of a fluid parcel on the wing, and we found an expression for that in the earlier lecture, we sub that into equation um, 529, which is, mm, let's see, where is equation 529? This equation. So we sub wa into this equation, and we sub phi u prime into this equation and that gives us ln c. So as we mentioned, w a is the is is the vertical velocity due to the kinematics of the wing, and we um, derived this expression from last lecture. So to start off to find w a, we know that. Z A here of X and T and Z A is the vertical position of some point on the wing. So um, Z is the position is the vertical position of the of some point on the wing. And that is a function of X to vary the position along the wing and a function of T as the wing moves in time. That is equal to minus h minus alpha x minus b a. So just to give you an illustration of what's going on, we assume that the wing is at some position h 
where positive h is in the negative z direction, and the wing is at some angle alpha, and the pitching point is at some point ba from the mid chord of the wing. So this point is the mid chord, and we define the pitching point to be at ba length away from the mid chord, where B is the semi-chord length or half the chord length and A is, uh, for example, some ratio of the semi-chord length where the wing is pitching. For example, if A is equal to half, that means that the wing pitches about half B from mid-chord. And mid chord is defined, so the mid chord is here, and the positive direction is defined to be um, to the right side. So it would be pitching about some point here. Whereas if A is negative half, then you're pitching about a point that's before the mid chord. So taking this into account, the position ZA as a function of X is equal to minus h, which is the displacement of the wing itself relative to the, to the x-axis, minus alpha, um, parentheses, x minus ba. And you can double check that, for example, um, if, let's say, you, you want to find the position of x equal to let's say minus 0.5a, sorry, minus 0.5b, so it's the point here, that means ZA will equal to minus h minus the angle alpha, and then angle alpha is the inclination, minus 0.5b minus ba, where the a is the point about which you're pitching. So to find WA, we to find WA, we simply take the time derivative of ZA. So WA, well, sorry, you, you don't take the time derivative. It's not just taking the time derivative. It's the expression we uh, introduced in the last lecture that is a dependent on the time derivative of ZA, which is related to the um, vertical motion of the wing plus u dza over dx. And u dza dx is the component uh, in the vertical direction of the fluid parcel due to the fact that there's a free stream. And taking the derivative, you get minus h dot minus u alpha minus alpha dot x minus ba. So, we came up with the expression for WA based on the kinematics of the wing. Now we will again let x equal to b cosine theta. And recall the equation 5259 from Bisplinkov, which we introduced earlier, earlier, phi u prime of theta and t is equal to minus b over pi of the integrals theta to pi and zero to pi of w a sine squared psi over cosine psi minus cosine theta d psi d theta. So here we will sub w into this expression and do some ugly math, which is showcased in the book, and you end up with the following expression. Phi u prime of theta and t is equal to b h dot plus u alpha sine theta plus b squared alpha dot sine theta of half Mm. 
of half cosine theta minus a. And then we sub this expression into 5, 2, 6, 4. And we finally arrive to the non-circulatory component, which comes out to be pi rho b squared, h double dot plus u alpha dot minus b a alpha double dot. And that is the expression of the non-circulatory force, which is the added mass force experienced by the wing due to the unsteady motions of the wing, which again, as I said, is not so this term, not present in quasi-steady airflow theory. And the reason it's not present there because again, the name of the theory is quasi-steady thin airflow theory. So we are making the assumption that even though there is some unsteady motion, the unsteadiness or the pitch rates and the um, the uh, uh, surging and heaving rates are so small that they are negligible and thus they produce a negligible amount of added mass force. In contrast to that, Theodorsen does not make that assumption. So it takes into account the unsteadiness of the motion of the wing, which produces a non-circulatory force and we, again, as a reminder, we were able to obtain this result through uh, introducing a source and uh, sink sheets to our circle plane, which introduced no circulation in the flow. All right, so this is the end of this lecture. And next lecture, we will talk about the derivation of the circulatory force.